welcome to Yesterday, Today, Tomorrow. My name is Mariana Cordier, and I am your host. The rapid growth of the cryptocurrency presents possible investors with many questions. If you are considering uh, investing in digital assets, you may be wondering if it's legal, if it's right for you, tax consequences, or even whether it might be a scam. I have two incredible guests here to clear all these issues up for us. I have Dr. Rod Brennan. He's a professor at Rutgers University and an expert on Bitcoin, blockchain, accounting, and internal audit practices. I also have Professor Joseph Bailey. He is a professor with the Smith School of Business, University of Maryland, and uh, researches the topics of economics of electronic commerce and cryptocurrency. <laughs> That is a mouthful, gentlemen. <laughs> what job. does it mean? What is cryptocurrency, Joe? Uh, well, cryptocurrency is uh, maybe one of the most understood or misunderstood uh, technologies which is shaping some of our, our global financial markets. So uh, generally, it's, it's kind of really an asset much more than a currency. I think the naming is a little bit wrong, uh, but it was built on the idea that it's kind of this... Uh, unique digital thing that has some value and can be used for transactions. It could be used to hold and, and appreciate in value. Um, but it's, it's really just, you know, from a technology uh, standpoint, nothing more than a unique string of digits that everybody has agreed has some value and some attribution to ownership. And then if we do it right, it can be a platform for things like currency value creation and transactions. Wow. So what does that mean for the common man? <laughs> well, I would say for, for most people, it, it, it doesn't mean too much. I think people have been on the outside looking at this and kind of scratching their heads and trying to figure out what it means. But there are some people who really do understand what it means from a, um, from a market and a trade perspective. So I think the first thing that the general person should know is it's something that you don't want to just speculate in without really paying attention to what goes on. Unlike, let's say, a, a share of a company which has some intrinsic value because you're owning a portion of a business, it's not clear that there is some intrinsic value associated with uh, a cryptocurrency such as uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Dogecoin. But what there is, is um, certainly a lot of speculation, a lot of interest in it. Um, and, and we're still kind of catching up with respect to things like the tax implications and the regulation and kind of institutional support of things like cryptocurrency. Um, one of the reasons why I think kind of, um, you know, some uh, international markets like it is because it really is not tied to any one um, traditional kind of currency of, of a country. So if you're interested in trying to avoid, let's say, government regulation and you're trying to trade across uh, different jurisdictions, cryptocurrency might be um, kind of your place to go. And that's one reason why it has this kind of stereotype as being a currency that could be used to support um, arguably, you know, illegal trades coming out of places like North Korea or Iran, uh, as well as maybe some black market transactions. So, you know, uh, it has uh, some potential to shape and transform markets, and, and not all of it is positive. Okay, so Dr. Brennan, what do you say? Okay, <laughs> well, um, I'm I'm kind of bullish on the concept because you know it is it really isn't a new concept. It's uh. It's basically a distributed ledger using technology like cryptology and other te technology to secure it. And as an auditing professional, I'm very impressed with how secure it is. Now, now I'm talking just about the blockchain and the, it, itself, and not necessarily the, the ramps on exchanges and things like that. But I think, uh, I, I think also it's inevitable and it's going to be disruptive for the reason that it's ultimately cheaper, better, faster, and way more secure than what we do today. And I can go into all that from an auditing perspective, but just suffice it to say that, you know, it really, as, as uh, uh, Professor Bailey shared, it's nothing more really than a distributed ledger secured by cryptology is all it really is now. Now, and I think the other thing is that we're just at the at the uh, vanguard, the very beginning of this, because uh, we're we're using the word cryptocurrency, which really is a misnomer because it's not a currency. It's classed primarily, usually as a uh, indefinite, lived, intangible in, in in the accounting right now. But and that's a bad classification too. But uh, what's coming now is uh, 
the, the, the tokenization of many things in addition to things that are used or, or resemble currencies. And by the way, there, 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 there's five to 7,000 of these now, all of which have very different uses. You know, some, some do act like currencies, some act like financial instruments, some act like commodities, some act like inventory. So, so to say that they're all one thing is very hard as well because it depends on their use case and that's how they should be regulated and accounted for. But I, I'm, I, I think the biggest thing is yet to come and that's when we start to digitize uh, illiquid assets such as real estate already, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, artwork and stuff are being, uh, you know. Um, and, and to the point about, uh, you know, it being used by criminals, that has been a problem. But I'll tell you this part of it is that uh, using a blockchain technology to do nefarious actions is actually not a real good idea because what you do is forever memorialized on a distributed ledger that's distributed to many people. And, and Let me stop you for a second and ask you, for those of us who don't understand or don't know, what is blockchain? Okay, blockchain is simply what uh, the, the first cryptocurrency, the first blockchain uh, was Bitcoin, and it is it is simply a distributed ledger. So as opposed to having a centralized ledger that's updated by many people, you know, and, 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 and has a central governance, a distributed ledger is a ledger that goes out to everyone. So, for example, Bitcoin, every transaction on Bitcoin goes out about every 10 minutes to millions of people, and it's secured by millions of miners. And the point that I always make from the security standpoint is if you and I work for a bank and we're DBAs, uh, the entire bank security system today is secured by an auditing principle called four eyes. And that means that I can give you access to uh, super user access to make transactions or do something, but I can't use it. I can approve it. You can use it, but you can't approve it. And I'm also a certified fraud examiner. And in 2020 report to the nations, 51% of some almost 3000 fraud cases were uh, collusive, meaning there was more than one people person uh, perpetrating the fraud. And if you have collusive fraud, you can override any four eyes principle anywhere in any financial institution, any bank, anywhere. However, with something like Bitcoin or with a blockchain, you need uh you know, 10 eyes, 100 eyes, you have a thousand eyes or more looking at every transaction and securing it before it goes on the blockchain. Now, I know there are things that are done with ransomware and other things, but most of them are done by abusing smart contracts and which we can talk about later and, 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 and the ramps on and off of the blockchain. So from that point, it's very, it's very secure, but it's simply a ledger that's a blockchain is simply a ledger that's distributed to everybody. That's 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 participating in it, whether it's a private or public blockchain. Professor and, Bailey, you wanted yeah. to add to that. Well, I, I wanted to pick up on it because I think Dr. Brennan is absolutely right in terms of making sure that uh, you know your audience understands the difference between the blockchain, which enables cryptocurrency, you know, as a distributed ledger, right. versus the cryptocurrencies, which is one kind of use case or instantiation yeah. of of the use of the blockchain. The, the one thing um, that I think the audience should also know is because it is distributed, it's distributed across geographic boundaries. Yes. And so you would have a ledger system whereby, let's say, um, one of the certificate authorities over in China, as well as the United States, and maybe in Brazil and Germany, all of them would have kind of a, a receipt of a transaction that took place. And so while it gives tremendous transparency and accountability to say, oh, yes, we all agree that this, let's say, non-fungible token has actually changed ownership you know, between these two people. It's kind of shared throughout all of those different geographies. And one of the concerns has been is kind of what does that mean from a, a governance uh, standpoint, right. kind of big G government uh, standpoint. Now, if you have nothing to hide and you're willing to share that information, it, it provides incredible transparency. And so companies like Unilever have said, we want to adopt blockchain. We want to show that our supply chain and procurement practices are done in a way consistent with our ethics and our values. So they want it to be open and transparent and, and frankly, very timely. You know, one can yeah. imagine if you're trading stocks, you could get access to transactions that are happening day of in a blockchain before waiting, let's say a few months for an auditor to come in and actually certify that things are happening. So one could imagine this really speeding up the liquidity of markets. Yeah, and, and I think a good analogy would be, think of iOS or Windows as the blockchain and then uh, 
the, any of these cryptocurrencies, be it Bitcoin, Filecoin, whatever, they're just apps that run on the blockchain. That's the idea. The blockchain is really the innovation here. You know, the, 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 the cryptocurrencies, the NFTs or tokenization in the future are just apps that are running on this, this technology. And so my question to you is, you've got, I'm sure both of you students in the classroom and they're all thinking, I need to pay my student loans. How about if I invest a little bit in, in this currency? How do you identify to test the waters, uh, one, and, and how would you go about doing that? What would be your advice? And I'll let you both take a stab at it, starting with Professor Bailey. Well, I would say the students are very excited about uh, investing. Uh, they don't seem to mind the volatility that happens with some of these cryptocurrencies. Uh, and because many of them have opened up uh, Robinhood accounts, as they're at least dabbling a little bit, even if it's a relatively small, small portfolio. And it doesn't take a, you know, too much Python coding to go ahead and set up basically an algorithmic trader where you can take a look at the volatility of a particular cryptocurrency and make a spot market trade, you know, hold that position for a short period of time and get out of it. I'm not sure uh, the students always understand the tax implications for that in terms of holding an asset for a short period of time with any appreciation. But you know, I would say you know, I kind of ask them to, to start with stocks before they start going to something as volatile as you know, Bitcoin, uh, because they have to have some idea about how to evaluate them, look at the future, kind of set up a shadow portfolio. They're usually not taking their kind of tuition dollars and you know, doing double or nothing on a Dogecoin. But what they are doing is they're at least kind of experimenting and they believe that kind of it's their generation's next thing. So there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm and that shapes markets. I mean, we saw just a few months ago with kind of GameStop, uh, uh, GameStop kind of stock kind of escalating a lot because you get this kind of crowd uh, or herding behavior that happens. And I think a lot of them are excited about it. And I... I I, I agree. Uh, the one thing I do is I encourage uh, because most cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum are demonetized to eight or 16 positions. I tell my students, uh, take $50, take $100. No, don't, don't take your you know, mortgage, mortgage your home and your, to, to, uh, you know, your life on it and, uh, and invest in some of them, not to make money, but to learn about it. Because I, I, that's what I actually did. I got asked by a fintech company that does accounting and auditing technology, it's called Luca for, uh, for blockchain, to help them do auditing and, uh, and on blockchain. And I, uh, I didn't know anything about blockchain four years ago. And they said, don't worry about that. We'll teach you that. So one of the things I did to learn it was I bought just a small amount of these coins and I started uh, you know, working on them and trading with them. And yes, uh, Professor Bill is absolutely right. The, uh, the the schedule one of the 1040, the first question it asks you is if you did any transactions, because every transaction you do per the IRS listing it as a property becomes a, you have a capital gain or loss. So there are tax implications. But, uh, you know, students or anyone, even my wife, I encourage them to, you know, buy a little bit of it and just 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 learn the technology because again it's the underlying technology well i've lost money on some i've made huge amounts of money on others but it doesn't matter I, i've learned the technology through doing that you know a hundred dollars fifty dollars whatever you're comfortable with what is the one thing or two things or tips that you need to look for to avoid the scammers like i think that uh some of the concern and hesitancies because they're unfamiliar with it there may be you know how do i know if it's a legit uh, whatever, as opposed to a scam. I would say the first thing is, you know, if somebody's sending you an email, you know, asking for credit card information, definitely avoid that. I mean, we, we do have brokers uh, who participate in the space and can help kind of be a trusted uh, agent for you to go ahead and hold on uh, to your investment. So Coinbase is a very popular one. I mentioned Robinhood, uh, but there are also kind of index funds that kind of track some of the Bitcoin. And so you can even go to a Schwab, for example, and and have uh, some position in, in, in cryptocurrency, you know, at kind of a, a, a kind of aggregate level. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I, I, I usually encourage people to use Coinbase or Polonex or Kraken or one of, one of the top ones. It's interesting, a study uh, by MicroStrategies to the SEC showed that 85% of the some several hundred exchanges a few years ago uh, had some type of uh, wash trading going on, you know, hyping up the the value. So I think if you use these good exchanges in good jurisdictions that have KYC, know your customer and any money laundering ALM, uh, AML, 
I, I think, and I, I use, I use Coinbase, some people use others, and, but, but there's about 10 of them that you can really trust that are doing SOC reports, for example, and are reporting to the IRS and others. So, yeah. So Professor Bailey, you made a really good point of not investing your student loan money or your mortgage or anything like that. So for, uh, you know, the newer investors or people who are just getting their feet wet, what are some tips that you would give them? I mean, I think the first thing, like any good investment, you have to figure out what your risk profile is. You know, if you are somebody who is trying to, you know, uh, take on a lot of risk, um, then then maybe cryptocurrency is for you. But if it's, you know, let's say you're approaching retirement age and you're looking to go ahead and diversify your portfolio, you might want to think twice before kind of, you know, betting the house or, or betting a significant part of your retirement savings. So, you know, you've got to be able to put up with some of that volatility. And then, of course, it's, it's a risk exposure thing as well. I think there's a, a lot of people want to join kind of when times get good and they might uh, be a little bit over exuberant about kind of what the future might be. Uh, but just, you know, I think a lot of the graphs that show you the Bitcoin prices, for example, it kind of creeps up and then it'll drop very precipitously. And everybody's excited when it goes up and not everybody is excited when it drops down. So, you know, again, learn through investment. I think Dr. Brennan is absolutely right. Like start with a little bit, see if this is for you, um, you know, learn about what the technology can enable, about how to kind of fit it into a, a bigger portfolio. And um, Dr. Brennan, what about the, how you can spend it? You know, the, you talk about the investing and, and you had mentioned earlier something about uh, know which exchange you're on or whatever, because some of it you can spend it and some of it you, it, you use it differently. Is it, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the retail, I mean, if you go buy, for example, a cup of coffee with one millionth of a Bitcoin and you can do that, uh, you've now created a capital gain or loss for that cup of coffee that you have to report. So I, I don't know if people really want to do that. You know, I think most people are holding it on their own behalf as just an investment. So, but, uh, you know, there are, there are, I mean, you could, well, I guess he canceled it, but you could have bought a Tesla car with a Bitcoin if you wanted to a little while ago. Elon, I think, went back on that one. But, you know, I, I think what I'm interested in, I'm doing a little bit of dabbling in now is uh, the whole lending part of it and staking, okay, staking or mining. So stake, staking is the replacement kind of for the proof of what's called proof of work. But so what you do, you can earn money on your crypto while while you still own it by by staking, which is becoming a part of one of the people who help secure the network. And again, I wouldn't risk any more in that than I would in what I buy. But, you know, just just learning a little bit. Interesting. The interest rates that they're paying on crypto is, you know, anywhere from four to 12 percent or 18 percent. And I don't know who's earning that in other investments right now. But again, if it's just with your 50 dollars and you're playing around with it, it, it's OK. You know, I mean, I mean, go ahead and learn, learn it. You know, and my advice is invest in things you research and you like. You know, I, I recently invested in a, a something called Filecoin, which is distributed storage. It uh, threatens to disintermediate, for example, cloud storage, because it's a way to use cryptology, hashing and security to uh, have storage that's totally distributed with no single point of failure and can be reconstituted at any time. It's a new technology. There's there's a lot of people in it, whether Filecoin makes it or not. I don't know. But the technology interests me. And so I do research on, on, the, on what they're doing, you know, read their white papers, read the press about them and do the same risk analysis that Dr. Uh, Bailey was just talking about, you know, do, do that homework. And if there's something you like and something you, you understand because you researched it, then put 10 bucks in it, you know, whatever. The other thing I wanted to ask you is um, you mentioned owning a bit in um artwork or on other things as opposed to having to own 100% of that Picasso or Monet. Is that really something that's coming? I mean, it's, it's here. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we have these kind of digital hashes that are unique and everybody, because it's this distributed letter, everybody agrees there is one true owner of it. So the very first tweet or a New York Times article or, you know, an NBA video, all of these things have kind of created these non-fungible tokens there are unique digital assets that somebody owns. Again, I think there's no intrinsic value, but you know, the idea is that I own it and it appreciates in value and I'm willing, you know, I'm able to sell it for somebody else for even more money. And that distributed ledger is still the kind of the, the you know, the, the blockchain that's there is supporting all of these assets. Yeah, and like I'm, I'm not an artsy guy, so I actually don't invest in any of the NFTs. But what really interests me is 
Think about if you could own $3 of every building in New York City and you could trade it and you could at, with complete security because it's indexed on a blockchain. It's, it's it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's hashed and secured by a blockchain. And, and research shows that illiquid assets that can be traded in active markets uh, increase in value. So, you know, I could own $3 worth of the Citicorp building and I could, uh, you know, invest in futures and derivatives on those and I could sell it. And, you know, where today, if you want to own the Citicorp building, you got to have a lot of money and sign a lot of papers and do a lot of closing. So it, it's just a way to, you know, and, and another example would be you want to own gold uh, from the Royal Mint and it has a every big bar of gold has a serial number on it. So you have a token on a blockchain that's completely secure. It can't be, it can't be hacked uh, and unless someone gets your, your private key. And you can own that gold without ever moving that gold. I can own parts of gold without trying to put it in a safety deposit box or whatever. So I think that's going to be really interesting when, and that includes artwork and stuff. I stay away from art because I'm not artsy. I don't really understand it. So, <laughs> and, and Dr. Brennan, I'm curious because I, I agree with you 100% that it's this liquidity that you can put in illiquid markets by creating these kind of digital assets. But right. isn't it also the divisibility of it? The idea that yeah. I couldn't you know, own it if it was worth a million dollars, but if I can own a fraction of that million dollars, right. now all of a sudden it's an accessible asset. Right. And one of the, one of the neatest things about this whole blockchain technology is that it gives the opportunity to 2 billion or more people in the world that are currently unbanked and can't monetize things they have. And, and blockchain provides an opportunity at a very you know, granular level to, to allow them to enter markets without a lot of friction and without, you know, all you need is a, you know, a, a smartphone. I think 65% of people in third world countries actually have smartphones. So they could, they could monetize, you know, whether they're selling pigs in Ghana or, 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 or whatever, they can monetize the things. And I think that's an exciting sort of altruistic part of this whole thing. How's that gonna affect the, the, the traditional investing? Is it gonna impact it? Like the I mean, stocks, I, the bonds? I mean, I think it already has. I mean, I think yeah. most people who are high net worth individuals, you know, they've at least considered the question, you know, should cryptocurrencies be part of my portfolio? Now, some of them have looked and said it, it won't be. I know Warren Buffett is, is particularly kind of vocal on staying yep. away from it. Yep. But I think a lot of people are looking at it, especially when you take a look at the interest rates for safe investments or bonds right now. Cryptocurrency can be very exciting to them. And I think what you're going to see is that the public companies and the large institutions have all but been on the sidelines until very recently. And now you mentioned earlier, you know, Tesla and MicroStrategies and Square and others are putting it on their balance sheets now and investing in it. And, the, and what we need, and I'm an intimate part of this right now with, with the AICPA and others is, and the FASB, we need some regulation, you know, because it isn't crypto anarchists that uh, are doing this stuff anymore. It's, it's, it's big institutions that have reporting responsibilities. But the opportunity for, I mean, already cross-border payments, huge, you know, uh, uh, um, remittance rails, huge. You know, they're, it's, it's disintermediating them. It, it, you know, Swift is, you know, blockchain can do things way better than Swift can, you know, so, so a lot of, you know, a lot of changes. And, and I think it's, it's coming fast and it's going to have fallbacks. You know, China's banning it. And I think China's banning it just because they're coming out with their own central bank digital currency and the U.S. may do the same. So uh, to me, it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit like fighting the, the horseless carriage in the, in the early 1900s. You know, you, you, you're going to have a, it, it, it's going to have setbacks, but it, it's the, the blockchain I'm talking about is coming. Not, not Bitcoin, not, not any particular one, but it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a neat technology. Yeah. So, Dr. Brennan, may I ask you, because I, I know that sure. the separation of, of Bitcoin and, and, and everything from the underlying blockchain is important. Do you see the market shaping out where Bitcoin or Ethereum or Doge or whatever you, you mentioned, a file coin as well? Um, like, yeah, I mean, do you see that kind of all coalescing to be one currency or do you see this being a very fragmented market? No, I, I think I think it's going to continue to be a fragmented market. And, and, and I think we may not have even seen the winners yet. You know, when the, when when China fully releases its central bank digital currency, U.S. Treasury is talking about doing that. We'll see how those impact impact the, you know the others i i'm actually not that bullish on bitcoin because it does have this energy issue you know the proof of work which is a consensus mechanism that secures the network uses huge amounts of electricity and you can argue away that they're using renewable electricity but 
you know, that's a tough one in this world today because we're very sustainability. But there's other alternatives. Proof of stake doesn't cost any real electricity and zero knowledge proof and other 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 consensus. And these are just mechanisms for securing the network. That's all. So, you know, they're they're good. So I don't know. You know, I, I always say this back in the 80s, there were 15 companies that had personal computers and you could have you knew the personal computer was coming. So you could have bet on you know, HP or Dell or Tandy or Compact. I mean, you bet on Atari or Compact, you would have lost all your money. If you bet on one of the others, you would have won. That was only picking 15. Now there's 7,000 of these things, you know, pick a winner. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, that's, that's a lot of, of choice and a lot of uh, uh, research that everyone will have to do to figure out what is the, the best investment. I've got about 20 seconds left. Any last words, Professor Bailey? Uh, I would just say, you know, buyer beware. If you're willing to go ahead and do this, go it with eyes wide open and be ready to go ahead for a wild ride. All right. And, and you have also a quick last word, uh, Dr. Brennan? Yeah, I just say, just get your toe in the water. Don't risk anything, but learn the technology because it is disruptive in many areas beyond what we're seeing today. All right, folks, that is all we have about this show. Hopefully we'll have more to come to kind of expand on what we've learned today. I'm Mariana Cordia, I'm your host, and I appreciate my guests being on and the audience for watching. And we're on YouTube and Facebook. See you next time. Mm -hmm.